All right, so I'm really curious about this video here. It says, most filmmakers stop here. And uh, I'm a filmmaker. And so let's see why this, the reason why 90% of filmmakers don't succeed. Whether you're interested in filmmaking as a hobby or you want to do it professionally, we pretty much all want to succeed. Facts. What success looks like is going to be different for all of us, but whatever your goals are, I think we can all agree it's frustrating to fall short. But over the years of working in the industry and coaching a ton of filmmakers through one-on-one -on -one calls and my documentary cinematography course, I've realized that for a lot of people out there, success isn't coming nearly as quickly as it could. And I found that what separates those few who rise to the top from those who never seem to get anywhere really just boils down to two simple things. And if you apply them over time... You Man, sometimes just watching the type of gear that some of these guys got have, <laughs> it's insane. Like, this man is literally carrying around, like, his setup is, like, that setup right there is, like, over 10K. Like, guarantee, like, it's not even like, I, can, I don't even have to say guaranteed. Like, the tripod itself is about $400. Like, I think that's a Sony FX9, I think. I think that's what that is. He's issued no. filmmakers through one on one calls and my documentary cinematography course. I've realized that for a lot of people, the shots are amazing, though. And he's shooting anamorphic. As quickly as it could. And I found that what separates those few who rise to the top from those who never seem to get anywhere really just boils down to two simple things. And if you apply them over time, you'll be doing more than 90% of the filmmakers out there. <laughs> Before I dive in here, I want to start out by comparing two very different filmmakers. The first one feels like they've been treading water and getting nowhere for years, while the other one went from being a commercial fisherman to a full-time filmmaker with multiple retainer clients and a publication in National Geographic, and they did all that in under a year. The first filmmaker God, has that. thought about getting more serious with their filmmaking for a while, maybe even years. They've watched everything they can find on YouTube, and they've invested in some gear, maybe even a lot of gear, and they have a notebook or a Google Doc jammed with all sorts of ideas for projects they're going to make one day. Yet it seems like month after month, things never really go anywhere. And it's kind of like they're banging their head against a brick wall. This is the. I will say, like, this has nothing to do with, like, what he's talking about yet. I know he's kind of, like, setting the scene. But, like, the way a lot of YouTube videos are starting nowadays, where it's kind of, like, just such a, the, I guess, slow build up to the point. Like, makes me want to skip through, like, skip, 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 you know, like, <laughs> but, you know, I'm sitting here really thinking about the fact of, um, I'm, I'm gonna watch the whole thing with you guys. If I was watching this by myself, then I would probably just skip ahead until he kind of started getting to the point most common type of filmmaker I run into online, and I'm going to arbitrarily say that this makes up about 90% of the early career talent pool. Oh, wait, let me go back. understand me here. For a while, maybe even years, they've watched everything they can find on YouTube, and they've invested in some gear, maybe even a lot of gear, and they have a notebook or a Google Doc jammed with all sorts of ideas for projects they're going to make one day. Yet it seems like month after month, things never really go anywhere, and it's kind of like they're banging their head against a brick wall. This mm -hmm. is the most common type of filmmaker I run into online, and I'm going to arbitrarily say that this makes up about 90% of the early career talent pool. And don't misunderstand me here, there's nothing at all wrong with being an experienced I've got nothing but respect for anyone who's going after what they want. But in my experience, the vast majority of these people aren't getting anywhere, or at least not nearly as quickly as they could. Now let's look at the second type of filmmaker. This person started in the same position as our other example, maybe even around the same time, but somehow they just seem to have shot up out of nowhere to find success way faster than makes sense. Like somehow over the course of a year, they've been able to quit their day job, get their work into a publication of their dreams like Nat Geo, and they're booking 10 thousand dollar gigs but unlike okay. the first filmmaker who i just made up based on my experiences working with lots of frustrated people out there the second example is a real person my mentorship student from last year dwee when dwee and i met he was working as a commercial fisherman and had barely made any money at all through filming but by the end of the year he'd gotten his work into national geographic like i said he booked a ton of well-paying jobs, both one-offs and retainer clients, and was working so much he's able to rent an office for his brand new production company. I mean, I don't even have an office. You're a f 
disgrace. <laughs> I'm not saying any of this to take credit for Dewey's success because seriously, he did all of this on his own. He wasn't born with some crazy once in a generation talent and he didn't have a trust fund to support him. He was essentially just a normal guy with a dream and a good eye. So what did he do? What was that secret? All right, so we are two minutes and 53 seconds in and trying to figure out what this man did. So let's, let's go. Well, for starters, he took action. He didn't just listen to my advice. He acted on it. He made things happen, and he was relentless. And don't worry, this isn't one of those two steps. I'm not going to say just take action and then send you on your way here. But before I get into those steps, I wanted to stress that without action, none of this matters. Knowledge and theories are great, but if you don't actually act on them, you're going to get nowhere. It's easy to be infatuated with the idea of being a filmmaker, but the people who are able to make it work actually do stuff. It does take my word for it. Listen to what I mean, the yeah. legendary adventure filmmaker Pablo Durana had to say on this. I think people romanticize the idea of being like an adventure filmmaker, but like, how willing are you to get out of your tent when it's howling and negative 40 and get out to maybe just get one shot, but that's you know, an important shot to get. And um, yeah, it could be brutal. <laughs> I totally agree Shit. with that. Bro, I can't tell you guys like what type of craziness I've done, jumped over, climbed over, fallen through. Like, I've done all types of stuff to get the shot. Like, bro, like, it is insane. But you got to get the shot or die trying. Okay, no, not don't die trying. But, but you got to get the shot, though. I'll go here. The filmmakers who stand out don't live in the world of hypotheticals. They absorb the ideas, yes, they get inspired by them, sure, but then they act on them. Without that, none of this stuff will work, and I can't say it any more strongly than that. One of the only things I know about that will work without much effort is saving 70% on royalty-free music through this video's sponsor, uh, Audio. Nailed that plug. Uh, uh, but more on that later. So the first thing you see new filmmakers not doing is a bit of a head scratcher to me, but if you're one of those few who's actually doing this, the good news is that you're way ahead of the curve. One of the most common interactions I have with people trying to find their way in this industry goes something like this. Hey Luke, I'm writing to you because I've always had a dream of being a filmmaker and I have a few great ideas for projects I'd like to shoot. I recently bought such and such a camera with whatever lens, plus I have a drone and a gimbal or whatever and so on. I don't have okay. any finished projects yet, but I have some big plans for this year and I was hoping you'd be willing to talk to me and give me some tips for how I can grow my career. Can anyone see the problem here? Now, my issue isn't with people reaching out to me, and I'm always happy to hear from people who have filmmaking dreams, so it's not like I'm complaining about the initiative that these filmmakers show when they send that email. We all need mentors, and we all need help along the way. God knows I've had a ton of it myself over the years. Okay, the issue okay. is that they haven't even tried to do it on their own, and they're essentially asking someone else to do it for them. Honestly, it's no exaggeration that 9 out of 10 people I hear from haven't even finished one short project, even about their neighbor or their best friend or their dog for that matter. Yet they seem to think that someone else, me, can give them the secret to success. I'm sorry, but this is all wrong. Let's compare that. To I will say that a lot of people kind of look at, you know, filmmaking to a point where it kind of seems like an easy thing to do. Like, when you watch people actually... I guess not even watching people make films, but as a normal person watching somebody uh, make a movie or make a short or, or like when you're watching them see what they do. Um, oftentimes we watch people who have a lot of experience and what they do kind of seems effortless as they do it. And so I guess the barrier to entry, especially with cameras not being super expensive like they used to and things like that, like the barrier of entry is, is a lot easier to get into now. And filmmaking just seems like this easy thing, but it is not. It is a long, hard process to actually get good at making films. But at the same time, um, you got to get out there and try. <laughs> you can't just... Uh, watch tutorials over and over again to make it to a point where you think you know everything because you got to have the hands-on experience. It's kind of difficult to to learn from a book, if you will, or learn from a video. You kind of have to get your hands dirty.
to Dwi, who, when he came to me, had shot several shorts on his own, and even though they weren't as good as he wanted them to be, he'd taken the initiative and gotten started. It's a huge part of why I chose him in the first place. It's not that these shorts were the greatest thing I'd ever seen, but they showed me he was actually committed. Then, over the course of the year we worked together, he shot like six more or something crazy like that, and each of them was a little bit better than the last one. By the time the mentorship ended, he had a bunch of work samples to show what he was interested in and what he wanted to do. Were they as good as he wanted them to be? No, probably not. Did he want to make them better? Sure, of course. But did he wait for permission to start? No, he just made stuff. And as he did, he proved that he was going to make this stuff work whether I helped him or not. Now, a lot of his stories were about sports and athletes because that's what he's interested in. And it didn't take long for a few of those shorts to be seen by other professional athletes living in his area. And when they saw how dedicated and passionate he was and they liked the work he'd already shot, they asked him to start making things for them. And they paid him. Some of them paid him really well. Now, that's how it's done. You have to take the initiative yourself before anyone else can help you. And if you're approaching clients or production companies or mentors with a blank website, you're just not going to get anywhere. You have to prove to other people that you really want it as badly as you say you do because no one is going to take your word for it just because you say you're willing to do whatever it takes to make it in this business. The expression show don't tell is repeated all over the storytelling world from books to film and the same is true of a filmmaking career. Show people that you're doing it on your own and that you're going to keep producing stuff whether or not they're interested in getting involved at the moment and then they'll respond. That's when people will want to help you and hire you, not when you're just coming to them with dreams that you can't back up with any sort of evidence at all. Yeah, he's right about that, man. You kind of have to have that, that portfolio. got to be looking nice, you know. you got to show the type of work that you're wanting to work on. Um, I, my portfolio needs some work, man, because I just, I just be doing everything. <laughs> I just kind of – I do every, a little bit of everything, and it's – it's all over the place, but you know the main thing I want to do is a uh, narrative. So uh, paid paid jobs don't really don't really look at narrative works like that. So hey, we'll we'll see. I, I need to work on my stuff. And this just doesn't apply to people starting out either. This is a process that we all need to do whenever we're trying to grow in new directions. Like when I moved back to Canada after almost 15 years working overseas and I wanted to get a little more commercial work to supplement the doc stuff, I didn't get anywhere with the branded content agencies until I went out and shot a commercial on my own. I mean, it makes sense. Even though I have a ton of experience as a professional DP, why would an agency want to work with someone who hasn't proved what they can do on their own? That's literally what I was just saying. You got to have, you got to shoot the kind of work that you, you're wanting to shoot. I know I probably wouldn't take that meeting if the roles were reversed. As I've gotten more and more curious about the narrative world as well, I had to do the same thing yet again by volunteering on a proof of concept shoot to get some scripted stuff under my belt before I started asking for meetings with bigger players. But whatever the genre and niche you're trying to break into, the process is exactly the same. Make work on your own, put it into the world to show others that you're serious. Then, and only then, will you start to see results. If you do this, you'll be way ahead of the pack who are just sitting there waiting for things to be easy. And as you make these projects, you're gonna need music. And that's the perfect time to talk about the sponsor of this video, Audio. No. There are tons of these royalty-free music sites. To say you've no, we're gonna have to skip that, skip that. Already separated yourself from 90% of filmmakers out there, and you're actually out there making work on your own and sharing it. What's next? Well, you've probably heard the expression, it's not what you know, it's who you know. And even though this. That is so true! <laughs> is just as true in filmmaking as. Like, I, okay, so. When I, I was working on set once, I was working on a set for. What was that project? It was for. I want to say it was fake. It was for Vacation Friends. Was it? Yes. It was Vacation Friends on Hulu. And um, we was working at as background actors, uh, me and some friends of mine. And um, what ended up happening was uh, they was dropping off lunch. And um, for some reason, we were, we were in this like warehouse that was made to look like an airport. But for some reason, that when they dropped off lunch, uh, they gave us sack lunches that day. Uh, it was like just in like brown paper bags. So what ended up happening was um, they they pull up in a van in the warehouse and they put all the sack lunches like in a pile on the floor. And so me, I was like, yo, that 
that doesn't look right, man. People, you can't be just sitting people's food on the floor. So what I did was I went and like got some tables and I picked the sack lunches up and set them on the table. Um, and when it was time for everybody to eat, me and my friend was like handing the food out. Uh, we got noticed by somebody who was basically came in to talk to us. It was like, hey, who told y'all to do this? And I was like, nobody. And it was like, um, y'all want to be production assistants? And I was like, yeah. <laughs> so what ends up happening was um, he just took our name and number down. And we got hired for, uh, I want to say it was for Discover, a project called Genius for Aretha Franklin. And... We got that literally just off of knowing, well, we didn't really know that guy, but he, we know him now. And so what ends up happening is that's how you get the jobs in the industry. It's kind of like you end up, they and, and it's crazy because they say that everybody starts in background. And so when you, people go to background, like all the people that do background are other people in other departments usually like a lot of times you have like normal people who are just there as background actors but sometimes you have people who are uh in background who work other things and other departments and other projects and so uh we've we've gotten booked for multiple jobs not just for the aretha franklin but for like other projects too so you you got to get out there and network and network network and uh, yeah, he's right about that, man. You got it's, it's not about what you know, it's who you know. As it is in any other business, the majority of filmmakers I work with are just not networking the right way. Filmmaking is a team sport, and if you want to go far, you can't just work in a vacuum. Film school can be great at building connections, and the people you meet there can be your collaborators for the rest of your career. But I didn't go to film school, and I'm guessing a lot of you didn't either. So don't worry, you don't need to spend a hundred grand to do well in filmmaking, but you do need to take action and build your network on your own. But since starting this YouTube channel, I've been on the receiving end of a lot of real really ineffective networking attempts. And I want to make sure you don't make the same mistakes because the reason it's not working isn't what you might think. In just a second, I'm going to show you the brutal reality of what real networking looks like by showing you exactly what I had to do to land a 50 day international feature doc shoot this year. But first, let me describe what I see most people doing. So let's say I get an email or maybe I'm on a one-on-one -on -one consultation call with someone and they'll tell me that no matter what they do, they can't get anyone to respond to their networking emails. There's almost this tone of helplessness there, like I'm doing everything I can, why can't I get anywhere? And I feel for them, but then when I ask them a few more questions, it turns out that they only sent one email or maybe two, and then they gave up when they didn't get an immediate response. And while I do recognize the courage it takes to reach out in the first place, I'm sorry, but this just isn't enough. And before you start thinking that's easy for you to say, let me just open up my emails and show you what networking looks like, even for me, even with over a decade decade of experience and a pretty decent CV. For context, when I sent the first email, I just moved from Vancouver to Toronto and landing in a new city means making new connections. So I started combing the internet for producers, production companies, and directors whose work I respected, and a couple of them stood out. One of them in particular, who I'm not going to name, had done some work I really liked, and so I reached out with an email introducing myself and gave a little bit of my experience and why I wanted to connect with her especially, and then I waited. If you're interested in some tips on how to approach emails like this, I made a free networking guide you can download in the description, but it was a pretty standard intro for my playbook my actual inbox says hi my name is luke forsyth i'm a dp specializing in the doc world and have shot shows and features for nat geo vice netflix hbo showtime paramount plus espn good lord my man out here resume hit <laughs> crazy and lots of others i'm writing you as I'm relocating to Toronto from Vancouver and came up in a few conversations and blank came up in a few conversations with colleagues as a great production company to try and connect with. As I'm new to town, I was hoping I might be able to swing by and introduce myself and what I do in case you ever need DPs with my skill set. If anyone from blank would be willing to meet with me, I'd be happy to and it's convenient even just coffee shop if you see some of my samples you can look at here and i can also send over more details cv if you're interested okay that's not bad it's a very professional um email 
What's really good about this is it kind of puts who he's worked with up front uh, before. Like, sometimes you got name drop, you know. Um, I will say, like, when, I, when I'm when i doing my events, um, I do a lot of uh, conventions for, like, uh, Comic-Con and different things like that. So, like, you got to name drop folks you've worked with before but or else they won't take you seriously. They, they, they just kind of see you as, like, the the same as anybody else that's sending them a random email looking for looking for something. So, you know, that's kind of, you got to you gotta think about, it like, this kind of like a, like a soft interview almost when you send this, these type of emails. So you got to be professional. Eventually, I got an equally standard response back from her saying that she was glad to meet me, but she was traveling and would have to get back to me later. So essentially a brush off, a polite brush off, but still trying to get rid of me. Now, at this point, you might think, well, I tried and then move on. Maybe a little bit more depressed than before at the idea that no one is interested in your work. This is a mistake and it's why you're not getting anywhere. And honestly, I think she was trying to brush me off and hope that I would go away. But unfortunately for her, that's not my style. Instead, I made a note on my calendar to follow up exactly when she said she'd be free again and that's what i did two months later now flash forward 10 days after that i got another brush off i'm at capacity right now and let's circle back in a month so i made another calendar note waited a month and reached out again another 10 day silence then the same response i'll circle back to you within the next month the mo god dang so hey just said i'm finally in toronto after something so long ago vancouver i wouldn't i wouldn't recommend it <laughs> How's your capacity these days? Would love to introduce myself and see what we've got going on. What you got going on? Patience, okay. Hey Luke, you're settling. Hope you're settling okay. I made a note to circle back to you next month when we'll be looking to meet with potential DPs best. Okay. Month came and went and I didn't hear from her, so I followed up. This time it took her nearly four months to get back to me. Four months, God dang. Sorry for taking so long to get back to you. For this one, we had to put this on hold as schedule and shift it for a project. We're hoping to meet with you about a little bit about it. Below. But this time, it was to tell me they were interviewing DPs for a new project, huh? and she asked for a couple more examples of my work, which I sent. Three weeks after that, she asked me to get on a Zoom call with her and her directing partner, where they asked me some questions about my approach and my experience, and another month of silence before they finally asked for some references and then another month of silence before they eventually offered me the job. That was in December, over 10 months from when I first reached out. I said, that was almost a year, bro. <laughs> I followed up five times, even though everything in her response has indicated that she wasn't interested. Fast forward to now, and we've already shot the first international leg of the project, and we have follow-up shoots scheduled in Africa, the US, and Eastern Europe. And it's shaping up to be one of my biggest and most exciting jobs of the year. God now, if dang. you were to just look at my schedule and see three international shoots on the books, it's super easy to say it must be nice to have it so easy and then dismiss the effort and persistence it took to get there. And that's the typical response because it's so much easier to think that other people have made it while you can't get any traction after someone didn't reply to that Instagram DM you sent at 2 a.m. If it was easy, then everyone would be doing it. And not to hype myself up, but if I have over a decade of experience and a pretty damn good resume and I still have to spend 10 months chasing someone down to get a meeting, then what does that tell you about your networking? Have you really put all your effort into it? Or ah, have you like 90% like of the just put in the bare minimum? Be honest. Now there's a fine line between persistence and being annoying, but I think that example is useful because most people are lying to themselves about how hard they're trying. I'm not saying to email five times a week, don't call people on their home lines, don't be annoying. If people don't answer you after the second or third attempt, that might be a sign that they're not going to get back to you. But if you do get a response and that hit rate is going to be super low, but for those people who do get back to you, show them that you're really interested by following up respectfully, but persistently. Because if I will say, man, there's a, there's one company I gotta I gotta hit back up that I've been trying to possibly do some work with, and at first I didn't want to. At first, I kind of got brushed off, like he said, and I have about a decade of experience, and I'm probably not even in his ballpark range of like skill level. I don't know. But, um, like, I've, I've worked on a lot of professional projects and things like that as well. And these, they, they, they kind of blew me off. And I was at an event 
where the company that I was interested in working with, uh, where they were, uh, they were doing some photography shoots there. And, um, somebody who was working on the project had to ask how to use the flash. And, and so it's kind of like, it's kind of like you sitting here and you get brushed off. You got the skills, you got experience, you get brushed off for somebody who doesn't even know what they're doing, and and it's that I would say that part gets a little bit discouraging, as well. But also, I'm in I'm in Alabama, so and I'm a muscular black dude, and so I get passed up by tiny white girls all the time at jo in jobs. <laughs> like it kind of doesn't even matter if they're like um. If if the if we're it doesn't even matter about skill level sometimes you know it's kind of just matters about people's comfort and so I will say that's a bit of a difficult challenge that a lot of people probably don't have but I will say you know you can't let that discourage you if that's your situation as well so uh, yeah I don't know I think the video is just about done I think he's gonna close out with some final with, these are his final thoughts so. Let's see what's, let me, let me hit that real quick. Example is useful because most people are lying to themselves about how hard they're trying. I'm not saying to email five times a week, don't call people on their home lines, don't be annoying. If people don't answer you after the second or third attempt, that might be a sign that they're not gonna get back to you. But if you do get a response and that hit rate is gonna be super low, but for those people who do get back to you, show them that you're really interested by following up respectfully, but persistently, because it really is that easy to stand out in this business. Just those two steps, showing people that you're committed by continuously making work on your own over a long period of time, and then networking the right way, that's all you need to be doing more than 90% of the people out there. Ideas without action count for very little so take initiative and make things so others know you're serious and then don't just send one dm and then complain that things are helpless follow up stay on people's radars and be persistent without being annoying results take time but if you're creating regularly and getting your name into the world and then you stick with it over a long period of time like years not months you're going to be in the top 10 percent of filmmakers and you will rise to the top in time see ya you're not wrong man the filmmaking game is hard. It ain't for everybody, man. Y'all gotta stay. You gotta stay with it. Um, you gotta. You, you guys just keep trying, keep pushing, keep moving. But you know, while you're still reaching out to other people, you gotta keep doing it on your own because, you know, if you don't do it for you, then nobody's gonna do it for you. So, it's one of those hard lessons you gotta learn as a filmmaker. Anyway, guys, make sure y'all hit that subscribe button. I'm. I'm. This was, this was a good video. I ain't gonna lie. It was. It was pretty good. Uh, I will say uh, the the value of it that I received out of it was just mostly just keep trying, keep pushing, you know, keep reaching out. But um, let me know what y'all think if in the comment section. If y'all are filmmakers, I don't know if I got many filmmakers that's going to watch this, but, you know, we'll see. Uh, I'm out. It's Nitro. Peace.